All right, all right, we are live. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is the Moon of Yesra El Sol and I'm it's 101 Left Project. I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing through. I hope everybody, as soon as I come on this thing, now all of a sudden the phone wanna be doing like 50 doo-doo doops. Um, yeah, greetings and welcome back once again. We're trying to finish off Eladro Equiano. And so um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Lately, this, this screen has just been, let me see if I can turn it down. It's just bright for my little eyes here. And uh, um, man, I don't know how to turn this down. Hold on. I'm just going to have to put down the screen. Hold on one second. And then we could go ahead and get started. We are finishing up the left project. Like I said, if you would like to continue to keep up on the left project on the last days of, uh, what's this, December, the December month. Uh, this really is the race Hold on one second. Oh, this let me is stop it. It, um, YouTube, please don't try to act like I was trying to play something. That was your video. <laughs> but um, what was I gonna say? What was I gonna say? What was I gonna say? Um, oh, if you want to keep up on the last days of the lead project, because I'm definitely gonna come back to YouTube and do some other things. You know, uh, it's just the lead project kind of took precedence this year. But I have been doing commentary on Facebook as well as Instagram and a little bit of Twitter. So you could check me out in those locations for the, the usual Amuna Yisrael commentary, as well as on Brother Philippe. Shout out to Brother Philippe Matthews. I've been doing also a lot of collaborative work with Brother Philippe as well. So definitely. We're on Alado Equiano. This is uh, chapter eight, section four. So I'm going to try to at least finish off this chapter today. And we'll see where we, 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 we are. I'm a little bit tired, but we're going to push on through. Our first care. Oh, he got his freedom last yesterday. <laughs> right? The baby keeps saying, Mommy, are you going to get Eladu Ekiano off the boat? Well, so he finally got his freedom, but his ex-slave master kept pressing him to keep on with the ship. And they were shipwrecked Um, the last episode he dreamt about it and it actually happened he was concerned and so right now it says our first care after refreshment was to make us our tents to lodge in which we did as well as we could with some sails we had bought from the ship right now they're shipwrecked we then began to think how we might get this uninhabited place or get from this uninhabited place and we determined to repair our boat which was very much shattered and to put it to sea in a quest of a ship or some inhabited island. It took up us up 11 days before we could get the boat ready for sea in the manner we wanted it with a sail and other necessities. Having got all things prepared, the captain wanted me to stay on shore while he went to sea in quest of a vessel to take all the people off key. But this I refused. Like he, have, he learned to stop trusting these uh, these Europeans. So he says, but this I refused. And the captain and myself with five more set off in the boat towards New Providence. We had no more than two musket load of gunpowder with us. If anything should happen and our stock of provisions consisted of three gallons of rum, four of water, like they got about as much rum as they do water, some salt beef, some biscuit. And in this manner, we proceeded to see. On the second day of our voyage, we came to an island called Abico, the largest of the Bahama Islands. We were much in want of water, for by this time our water was expended, and we were exceedingly fatigued in pulling two days in the heat of the sun, and it began. It being late in the evening, we hauled the boat ashore to try for some for water and to remain during the night. When we came ashore, we searched for water but could find none. When it was dark, we made a fire around us for fear of the wild beasts as the place was an entire thick wood and we took it by turns to watch in this situation we found very little rest and waited with impatience for moving as soon as the light appeared we set off again with our boat in hopes of finding assistance during the day we were now much dejected and weakened by pulling the boat 
for our sail was of no use, and we were almost famished for want of fresh water to drink. We had nothing left to eat but salt beef, and that we could not use without water. So again, things is going down for him. Again, his life has been really, really wild. And uh, right about now, he's shipwrecked. So, and now they, they, they can't eat the salty food. You know, all of the stuff that now Caribbean people and American, but mostly I know Caribbean, you know, they, they like, oh, salt fish is like a, it's a national dish. I mean, that's what they had to do so that the food wouldn't go spoiled and they would still have access to something. And so basically he's saying he couldn't eat the salt beef because, which salt is a preservative, because it's like a chalk him and he don't got no water. In this situation, we tore all day in sight. We tore all day in sight of the island, which was very long. In the evening, seeing no reef, we made sure again and fastened our boat. We went, we, we went to look for fresh water, being quite faint for the want of it. And we dug and searched about for some of all the remainder of the evening, but could not find one drop. So that our deduction at this period became excessive and our terror so great that we expected nothing but death to deliver us. We could not touch our beef, which was salt as brine without fresh water. And we were in the greatest terror for the apprehension of wild beasts. When on welcome night came, we acted as on the night before. And the next morning we set off again for the island in hopes of seeing some vessel. In this manner, we toiled as well as we were able till four o'clock during which we passed several keys but could not meet with a ship and still famished with thirst, went ashore on one of those keys again in hopes of finding some water. Here we found some leaves with a few drops of water on them, which we lapped with such eagerness, we then dug in several places, but without success. As we were digging holes in search of water, the, there came forth some very thick and black stuff, but none of us could touch it except the poor Dutch Creole who drank about a quarter of it as eagerly as it had been wine. We tried to catch fish, but could not. And we now began to repine at our fate and abandon ourselves to despair when in the midst of our murmuring, the captain all at once cried, a sail, a sail, a sail. This gladdened sound was like a, a, a reprieve to a convict and all, and we all instantly turned to look at. But in a little time, some of us began to be afraid it was not a sail. However, a venture we embarked and steered after it. And in a half an hour, to our unspeakable joy, we plainly saw that it was a vessel. At this, our drooping spirits revived when we made towards her like with all speed imaginable. When we came near to her, we found she was a little sloop about the size of graves and hoy and, and quite full of people a circumstance of which we could not make out the meaning. Our captain, who was a Welchman, swore that we were they were pirates and would kill us. I said, be that as it might, we must board her if we were to die by it. And if they, and if they should not receive us kindly, we must oppose them as well as we could, for there was no alternative between their perishing and ours. This counsel was immediately taken, and I really believe that the captain, myself, and the Dutchman would have faced 20 men <laughs> who we had two cutlasses and a musket that I bought in the boat. And in this situation, we rowed alongside and immediately boarded her. I believe there were about 40 hands on board, but how great our surprise as soon as we got on board to find the major part of them were in the same predicament as ours. They belonged to a whaling swimmer that was wrecked two days before us, about nine miles to the north of our vessel. When she was wrecked, some of them had taken to their boats and had left some of their people and property on a key as we had done and were going like us to new providence to quest of a ship when they met with this little sloop called a wrecker whose employment in whose seas it is to look after wrecks they were then going to take the remainder of the people belonging to the schooner for which the wrecker was to have all things belonging to the vessel and likewise their peoples held to keep all the they could out of her and were then to carry the crew to New Providence. Chapter, I mean, chapter, section five of, oopsie, section five. Am I still on? I guess I'm still on, okay. We, a lot of Equiano, chapter eight, section five. 
We told the people of the record the condition of our vessel, and we made the same agreement with them as the Sunnah people had done. And on their compliance, we begged them to go to our key directly, because our people were in want of water. They agreed, therefore, to go along with us first, and in two days we arrived at the key to the inexpressible joy of the people that we had left behind, as they had been reduced to great extremities for want of water in our absence. Luckily for us, the wrecker had now more people on board than she could carry our victory for any moderate length of time. They therefore hired the soonest people to work on the wreck, and we left them our boat and embarked for New Providence. Nothing could have been more fortunate than our meeting with this wrecker, for New Providence was at such a distance, we never could have reached it in our boat. The island of Abaco was much longer than we expected, and it was not till after sailing for three or four days that we got safe to further end of it. Towards New Providence, we arrived there, we watered and got a good many lobsters and other shellfish, which proved a great relief to us as our provisions and water were almost exhausted. We then proceeded on our journey, but the day after we left the island and late in the evening, while we were yet amongst the Bahama Key, we were overtaken by a violent gale of wind, which obliged us to cut away the mast. The vessel was near pondering, for she parted from her anchors and struck several times on the shoals. We were expect we were we here expected her every minute to go to pieces, and each moment to our last. So much so that my cap, my old captain and sickly useless mate and several others fainted and death stared us in the face on every side. All the swearers on board now began to call on the G.O.D. of heaven to assist them. And sure enough, beyond our comprehension, he did assist us and in a miracle manner delivered us. In the very height of our extremity, the wind lulled for a few minutes and although the swell was high, beyond expression, two men who were expert swimmers attempted to go to the buoy of the anchor which we still saw in the water at some distance in a little punt that belonged to the wreck of which was not large enough to carry more than two she filled at different times in their endeavor sorry yeah filled at different times in their endeavor to get into her alongside of our vessel and nothing but death appeared before them and us but however they they said they might as well die that way as any other. A coil of very small boat with a little boy was put in along with them. And at last they got the punt clear from the vessel. And these two intrepid water heroes paddled away for life towards the buoy of the anchor. Our eyes were fixed on them all the time, expecting every minute to be their last. And the prayers of all those that remained in their senses were offered up to G.O.D. on their behalf for a spirited delivery and for our own which depend on them. And he heard and answered us, these two men at last reached the buoy and having fastened the putt to it, they tied one end of their rope to the small buoy that they had in the punt, the punt and sent it adrift towards the vessel. We on board observing this threw out boat hooks and lids fastened to lines in order to catch the buoy. At last we caught it and fastened a, a hawser to the end of the small rope. We then gave them a sign to pull and they pulled the lobster to them and fastened it to the buoy, which being done, we hauled for our lives. And through the mercy of G.O.D., we got a gain from the shoal to, into deep waters and the punt got safe to the vessel. I guess this is all sailor talk because I'm like, okay. <laughs> it sounds like you, you did what you were looking to do. It is important for anyone, for any to convince, sorry, it is imp impossible for any to conceive our heartfelt joy at this deliverance from ruin, but those who have suffered the same hardship, those whose strength and senses were gone came to them senses, sorry, came to themselves and were now as elated as they were before depressed. Two days after this, the wind ceased and the water became smooth. The punt then went on shore and we cut down some trees and having found our mast and mended it, we brought it on board and fixed it up. As soon as we had done this, we got on up the anchor and away we went once more for New Providence, which is three days more we reached safe after having been about three weeks in situation from which we did not expect to escape with life. Section six. The inhabitants here were very glad, uh, sorry, we were very glad. The inhabitants here were very kind to us and having learned our situation, they showed us a great deal of hospitality and friendship. Soon after this, every one of my old fellow sufferers that were free parted from us and shaped their course as inclination led. One merchant who had a large sloop, seeing our condition and knowing he wanted to go to Georgia, 
told four of us that his vessel was going there and offered us our free passage, our passage free on condition of helping to load and work the vessel. As we could not get any wages and found it very hard to get off the place, we consented to his proposal and went on board and helped to load the sloop. Although we had only our victuals allowed us, when entirely loaded, he told us she was going to Jamaica first, where we must go if we went in her. This, however, I refused, because he know every time he end up on an island, he end up being a slave. <laughs> so he's like, yo, now nah, I'm not trying to go to no Jamaica. I'm trying to get to the, you know, but the, state, the thing is that free men also were captured as slaves in America. But it seems like he has a, a great aversion to the islands. Uh, and he prefers the European over his own, as well as um, Europe, because this is where he's ultimately trying to get back to. Like I said before, I sense a lot of what people like to say, Stockholm syndrome or trauma bonding as it relates to Olado and the European. But let's go on. This, however, I refused, but my fellow sufferers, not having any money to help themselves with, were obliged by necessity to accept of the offer and to stay the course, though they did not like it. We stayed in New Providence about 17 or 18 days, during which time I met with many friends who gave me encouragement to stay there with them. But I declined it. Though had not my heart been fixed on England, I should have stayed, as I liked the place extremely. And there were some free blacks here who were very happy, and we passed our time pleasantly together with the melodious sound of cat guts under the lime and lemon trees. At length, Captain Phillips hired a sloop to carry him and some of the slaves that he could not sell here to Georgia. And I agreed to go with him in the vessel, meaning now to take my farewell of that place. When the vessel was ready, we all embarked and I took my leave of New Providence, not without regret. We sailed about four o'clock in the morning with a fair wind for Georgia. And about 11 o'clock the same morning, a sudden and short gale sprung up and blew away most of our sails. And as we were still among the keys in a very few minutes, it dashed the sloop against the rocks. Like he had a real hard time. Luckily for us, the water was deep and the sea was not so angry. But that after having for some time labored hard and being many in number, we were saved through G.O.D.'s mercy. And by us, by using our greatest exertions, we got the vessel off. The next day we returned to Providence where we soon got her again refitted. Some of the people swore that we had spells set upon us by somebody in Montserrat. And others said that we had witches and wizards among the poor helpless slaves and that we never should arrive safe at Georgia. But these things did not deter me. I said, let us again face the winds and seas and swear not, but trust to G.O.D. that he will deliver us. Like they can't get to their location. We therefore once more set sail and with labor or hard labor in seven days time arrived at safe at Georgia. After our, our arrival, we went up to the town of Savannah, and the same evening I met to a friend's house to lodge, whose name was Mosa. Oh, he, the first time, like, this, if this is not the first time I remember him actually giving the name of a melanated person. I went to a friend's house to lodge, whose name was Mosa, a black man. We were very happy at meeting each other, and after supper, we had light until between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. About that time, the watch or patrol came by and discerning a light in the house, they knocked at the door. We opened it and they came in and sat down and drank some punch with us. They also begged some limes of me as they understood I had some, which I readily gave them. A little after this, they told me I must go to the watch house with them. This surprised me a good deal after our kindness to them and I asked them, why so? They said that all Negroes who had a light in their house after nine o'clock were to be taken into custody and either pay some dollars or be flogged. Did you hear that law? If you had a light in your house after nine o'clock, you were supposed to be taken into custody or flogged. Some of the, so the dude asked him, he come in, drink their food, ask him for some lines and then tell him, pay me or I'm gonna beat you basically. Olado Equiano, this is chapter, what's this eight section six. Some of these people knew that I was a free man, but as the man of the house was not free and had his master to protect him, they did not take the li same liberty with him they did with me. I told them that I was free man and just arrived from Providence, that we were not making any noise and that I was not a stranger in that place, but was very well known there. Besides, said I, what will you do with me? That you shall see me, that, that you shall see, replied they, but you must go to the watch house with us. 
So it's like some Bogard system. You know, you have your freedom, but what really are you going to do with it when the whole system is a matrix meant to enslave you once again? Now, whether they meant to get money from me or not, I was at a loss to know. But I know immediately of the oranges and limes at Santa Cruz and seeing that nothing could pass would pacify them, I went with them to the watch house where I remained during the night. Early the next morning, these imposing ruffians flogged the Negro man and woman that they had in the watch house. <laughs> you know, the way he be talking, I could just hear the way he speaks. The way he speaks is funny. He says, these ruffians flogged the Negro man. And then they told me that I must be flogged too. I asked why and if there was no law for free men. And he told, and told them if there was, I would have it put in force against them. But this only exasperated them the more. And they instantly swore they would serve me as Dr. Perkins had done. Oh, remember Dr. Perkins was the one who beat him up, if I'm not mistaken. And were going to lay violent hands on me. When one of them, more humane than the rest, said that as I was a free man, they could not justify stripping me by law. I then immediately sent for Dr. Brady, who was known to be honest and worthy man. And on his coming to my assistance, they let me go. Section seven. This was the only disagreeable incident I met with while I was in this place. For one day, being a little way out of the town of Savannah, I was beset by two white men who meant to play their usual tricks with me in the way of kidnapping. As soon as these men accosted me, one of them said to the other, this is the very father we are looking for that you lost. And the other swore immediately that I was the identical person. On this, they made up to me and were about to handle me. But I told them to be still and keep off. For I had seen those tricks played upon other free blacks and they must not think to serve me so. At this, they paused a little and one said to the other, it will not do. And the other answered that I talked too good English. And I replied, I believe I did. And I also with me revengeful stick equal to the occasion. And my mind was likewise good. Happily, however, it was not used. And after we had talked together a little in this manner, the rogues left me. Ruffians and rogues. <laughs> I stay in Savannah sometime anxiously trying to get to Montserrat once more to see Mr. King, my old master, and then take a final farewell of the American quarter of the globe. At last I met with a sloop called the Speedwell, Captain John Bolton, which belonged to Grenada and was bound to Mar Martinico, a French island with a cargo of rice. And I shipped myself on board her. Before I left Georgia, a black woman who had a child lying dead, being very tenacious of the church burial service and not able to get any white person to perform it, applied to me for the purpose. I told her I was no parson and besides that, the service over the dead did not affect the soul. I, however, did not satisfy her. She still urged me very hard. I therefore complied with her entreaties and at last consented to act the parson for the first time in my life. As she was much respected, there was a great company, both white and black, at the grave. I then accordingly assumed my new vocation. I can't with, I can't with him. <laughs> this man is too, now he a parson. He said, I then accordingly assumed my new vocation and performed the funeral ceremony to the satisfaction of all present, after which I bade adieu to Georgia and sail for Martinico. That was the end of chapter, what chapter I said? Chapter eight. So let's go ahead and read a little bit. Welcome to those who have just joined us. I'm going to go a little bit into chapter nine here, see how far I can get. Now he's a parson. He, he's officiating funerals now. <laughs> he's funny. All right. It says the author arrives at Martinico, meets with new difficulties, gets to Montserrat where he takes leave of his old master, sails for England, meets Captain Pascal, learns the French horn, hires himself with Dr. Irvin where he learns to freshen seawater. And you know, that was what I was thinking the whole time, like, if they learn how to take seawater and make it drinkable, leaves the doctor and goes a voyage to Turkey and Portugal and afterwards goes to a voyage to Grenada and another to Jamaica. Ret returns to the doctor and they embark together on a voyage to the North Pole with the Honorable Captain Phibbs, some account of that voyage and the dangers the author was in, he returns to England. So wild, wild life. So uh, chapter nine, section one. I thus took a final leave of Georgia for the treatment I received in it disgusted me very much against the place. 
And when I left it and sailed for Martinico, I determined never more to revisit. My new captain conducted his vessel safer than my former one. And after an agreeable voyage, we got safe to our intended port. While I was on this island, I went about a good deal and found it very pleasant in particular. I admired the sound of St. Pierre, which is the principal one of the island and built more like a European town than any I had seen in the West Indies. In general, also, slaves were better treated, had more holidays, and looked better than those in the English islands. After we had done our business here, I wanted my discharge, which was necess necess necessary, for it was then the month of May. And I wished to be at Montserrat to bid farewell to Mr. King and all of my other friends there, in time to sail for old England in the July fleet. But alas, I had put a great stumbling block in my own way by which I was near losing my passage that season to England. I had lent my captain some money, which I now wanted to enable me to prosecute my intentions. This I told him, but when I applied for it, though I urged the necessity of my occasion, I met with so much shuffling from him that I began at last to be afraid of losing my money as I could not recover it by law. For I have already mentioned that throughout the West Indies, no black man's testimony is admitted on any occasion against any white person, whatever. That was in America as well. And therefore my oath would have been of no use. I was obliged therefore to remain with him till he might be disposed to return it to me. Thus we sailed for Martinique from, from the Grenadines. I frequently pressed the captain for my money to no purpose and to render my condition worse. When we got there, the captain and his other owners quarreled so that my situation became daily more irksome. For besides that we on board had little or no victuals allowed us. And I could not get my money, not wages, nor wages. I could then have gotten my passage free to Montserrat had I been able to accept it. The worst of all was that it was growing late in July and the ships in the islands must sail by the 26th of that month. At last, however, with a great many entries, I got my money from the captain and took the first vessel I could meet with for St. Eustatia, for whence I went to another Basteri to sit in St. Kitts, where I arrived on the 19th of July. On the 22nd, having met with a vessel bound to Montserrat, I wanted to go in her, but the captain and others would not take me on board until I should ad advertise myself and give notice of my going of the island, off the island. I told them of my haste to be in Montserrat and the time then would not admit of advertising, it being e late in the evening and the vessel about to sail, but he insisted it was necessary and otherwise he said he would not take me. This reduced me to great perplexity, for if I should be compelled to submit to this degrading necessity, which every black free man is under and advertising himself like a slave when he leaves an island, and which I thought a gross imposition upon any freeman, I feared I should miss that opportunity of going to Montserrat, and then I could not get to England that year. The vessel was just going off and no time could be lost. I immediately therefore set ab about it with a heavy heart to try whom I could get to befriend in complying with the demands of the captain. Luckily, I found in a few minutes some gentlemen of Montserrat whom I knew, and having told them my situation, I requested their friendly assistance in helping me off the island. Some of them on this went with me to captain and satisfied him of my freedom, and to my very great joy, he desired me to go on board. Section 2, Chapter 9. We then set sail the next day on the 23rd. I arrived at the wished for place after an absence of six months in which I had more than once experienced the delivering hand of providence. When all human meanness of heart, which, I, which was increased by my absence and the dangers I had escaped, and I was received with great friendship by them all, but particularly by Mr. Doc, uh, Mr. King, to whom I related the fate of this, his sloop, the Nancy and causes of her being wrecked. I now learned with extreme sorrow that his house was washed away during my absence by the bursting of the pond at the top of the mountain that was opposite the town of Plymouth. It swept great part of the town away and Mr. King lost a great deal of property from the inundation and nearly his life. When I told him I intended to go to London that season and that I had come to visit him before my departure, the good man expressed a great deal of affection for me and sorrow that I should leave him and warmly advised me to stay there. He's insisting as I, as I was much respected by all the gentlemen in the place that I might do very well and in a short time have land and slaves of my own. For those who thought that 
free men or freed women didn't have the thought of having slaves. Slaves were, you know, Europeans made it a color thing, but to have other people at your beck and call was a human thing that spanned the globe over the millennia um, of civilizations that are trying to come up off the backs of others, basically. He said, I declined remaining any longer there and begged he would excuse me. I then requested he would be kind enough to give me a certificate of my behavior while in his service, with which he very readily complied and gave me the following. Montserrat 26 of the seventh month of 1767. The bearer hero of Gustavus Vasa was my slave for upward of three years, during which he has always behaved himself well and discharged his duty with honesty and astuity. That's like the reference letter, right? Robert King, to, to all whom this may concern. Having obtained this, I parted from my kind master after many sincere professions of gratitude and regard and prepared for departure for London. I immediately agreed to go with one Captain John Hammer for seven guineas, the passage to London, on board a ship called the Androma. What is this? Andromache? And on the 24th and 25th, I had free dances, as they are called, with some of my friends and countrymen previous to my settling or setting off. After which I took leave of all my friends, and on the 26th, I embarked for London, exceedingly glad to see myself once more on board of a ship and still more so in steering the course I had long wished for. So here you have a kidnapped, enslaved African freed, and he didn't spend very long on plantations. He, he was a seaman going back and forth and all over the world. With a light heart, I bade Montserrat farewell and never had my feet on, on it since. And with it, I bade adieu to, I just like saying that. <laughs> to the sound of the cruel whip and all other dreadful instruments of torture, adwar to the offensive sight of the violating chastity of sable females, which has too often accosted my eyes, which he spoke about before, talking about on the ships, how the men on the ships would rape and molest the young women, uh, and he would be witness to this. He said, uh, which has too often accosted my eyes, adwar to oppressions, although to me, less severe than most of my countrymen, and adore to the angry, howling, dashing serfs. I wish for grateful and thankful heart to praise the LORD on high for all his mercies. In this ecstasy, I steered the ship all night. I think I'm gonna read uh, three, and then we're gonna stop at section four and pick up. Whoa, wait, hold on, hold on. No, mm, uh, mm, mm. Okay, I might go through four. We had a most prosperous voyage and at the end of seven weeks arrived in Cherry Garden Stairs. Thus we were longing, thus were, we, were my eyes longing once more, gratified with a sight of London after having been a, absent from it above four years. I immediately received my wages and I never had earned seven guineas so quickly in my life before. I had 37 guineas in all, which I got cleared of the ship. I now entered upon the scene quite new to me, but full of hope. In this situation, my first thoughts were to look out for some of my for former friends, and amongst the first of those was Miss Gurens. As soon as I had regaled myself, I went to quest of those kind ladies whom I was very impatient to see, and with some difficulty and perseverance, I found them at Mays Hill, Greenwich. They were almost they were most agreeably surprised to see me, and I quite overjoyed the meeting with them. I told them my history at which they expressed great wonder and freely acknowledged it did their cousin, Captain Pascal, no honor. He then visited there frequently and I met him four or five days after in Greenwich Park. When he saw me, he appeared a good deal surprised and asked me how I came back. I answered in a ship, to which he replied dryly, I suppose you did not walk back to London on the water. As I saw by this man that he did not seem to be sorry for his behaviors to me, he sold him. Remember that? I think that was the captain who sold him. He thought he was going to be free and he sold him. So he's like, yo, what you doing back here, son? I suppose you, and this is who he wanted to run back to see. As I saw by his manner, he did not seem to be sorry for his behavior to me and that I had not much a reason to expect any favor from him. I told him that he used me ill, very ill. 
after I had been such a faithful servant to him for so many years, on which, without saying any more, he turned away and went away. He turned about and went away. A few days after this, I met Captain Pascal at Miss Gurin's house and asked him for my prize money. He said there was none due to me, for if my prize money had been 10,000 pounds, he had all a right to it all. So he's thinking all these Europeans is for him, and they're just being nice to exact his labor. And when he's looking for what they owe him, he they like, yo, I ain't got nothing for you. He goes on to say, I told him I was informed otherwise, on which he, made, he bade me defiance, and in a bantering tone desired me to commence a lawsuit against him for it. There are lawyers enough, said he, that will take the cause in hand, and you had better try it. I told him then that I would try it, which enraged him very much. However, out of the regards to the ladies, I remained still and never made any further demand on my right. Sometime afterwards, these friendly ladies asked me what I meant to do with myself and how they could assist me. I thanked them and said, if they pleased, I would be their servant. But if not, I had 37 guineas, which would support me for some time. And when I would be much obliged to them to recommend me to some person who would teach me a trade whereby I might earn my living. They answered me very politely that they were very, they were sorry it did not suit them to take me to as their servant and asked me what business I should like to learn. I said, hairdressing, he's bugged out. Now he, <laughs> you know, he you know, a lot of Adriano's bugged out. He said he will to be a hairdresser. I guess he want to cut hair now. He says, um, for those who just joined us, we're reading, what's this, chapter 9, section 3 of Alado Equiano. We're working our way through the Left Project. He just came back. He rolled up on the Euro, you know, captains who sold him back off, and they said, we ain't got nothing for you. So now he's trying to find another way to live. One thing we could say, he's a survivor. It says, they then promised to assist me in this, and soon after, they recommended me to a gentleman whom I had known before, one Captain O'Hara who treated me with much kindness and procured me a master, a hairdresser, in Coventry Court, Haymarket, with whom he placed me. I was with this man, and I guess a hairdresser in that day is a barber. I was with this man from September till February, following in that time he had a neighbor in the same court who taught the French horn. He used to blow it so well that I was charmed with it and agreed with him to teach me to blow it. Accordingly, he took me in hand and began to instruct me, and I soon learned all three parts. I took great delight in blowing on this instrument, the evening being long, and besides that, I was fond of it. I did not like to be idle, and it filled up my vacant hours innocently. At this time, also, I agreed with Reverend M Mr. Gregory, who lived in the same court where he kept an academy and an evening school to improve me in arithmetic. This he did as far as a barter and allegation, so that all the time I was there, I was entirely employed. In February 1768, you could follow along if you would like to. The link is in the box. Um, in February 1768, I hired myself to Dr. Charles Irving in Paul Mall, so celebrated for his successful experiments in making sea water fresh. And here I had plenty of hairdressing to improve my hand. This gentleman was an excellent master. He was exceedingly kind and good tempered and allowed me in the evenings to attend my school, which I esteemed a great blessing. Therefore, I thank G.O.D. and him for it and use all diligence to improve the opportunity. This diligence and attention recommended me to the notice and care of the three preceptors who on their parts bestowed a great deal of pains in my inst instruction. So this doesn't sound like the narrative of a slave, but once again, he saw slavery from a different position. Where was we? So he's going to school. He's back in England. I esteemed a great blessing. Therefore, I thank G.O.D. And, and him for it and use all diligence to improve my opportunity. This diligence and attention recommended me to the notice and care of the three preceptors who on their parts bestowed a great deal of pain in my instruction and besides were all very kind to me. My wages, however, were with were by two thirds less than I ever had in my life, for I only had 12 pounds per annum or year. I soon found would not be sufficient to defray their extraordinary expense of masters and my own necessary expenses. My old 37 guineas had by this time worn all way to one. I thought it best therefore to try to see again in quest of more money as I had been bred to it and had hitherto found the profession of it successful. I also a very great desire to see Turkey 
and I now determined to gratify it. This is 1760, what is this? 1767, where the height of, you know, slavery is booming right now in, in American colonies, English colonies, all is still booming. The slave trade is still legal. And he is just, you know, back and forth. Accordingly, in the month of May, 1768, I told the doctor of my wish to go to sea again, to which he made no opposition. And we parted on friendly terms. The same day I went into the city in quest of a master, I was extreme. I was extremely fortunate in my inquiry for I soon heard of a gentleman who had a ship going to Italy and Turkey, and he wanted a man who could dress here well. As I had been directed, which I found to be fitted up with great taste, and I already forbade or foreboded no small pleasure in sailing in her. Not finding the gentleman on board, I was directed to the lodgings where I met with him the next day and gave him a specimen of my dressings. He liked it so well that he hired me immediately so that I was perfectly happy for the shipmaster and voyage was entirely to my mind. All right, I'm going to read one, one more section. Section four. The ship was called the Delaware, and my master's name was John Jolly, a neat, smart, good-humored man, just as one I had wished to serve. He sailed for England in July following our voyage was extremely pleasant. We went to Villa France, Franca, Nice, and Leghorn, and in all these places I was charmed with the richness and beauty of the countries and struck with the elegant buildings with which they bound or abound. We had always in them plenty of extraordinary good wines and rich fruits, of which I was very fond, and I have a frequent occasion of gratifying both my taste and curiosity, for my captain always lodged on shore in those places which afforded my, me opportunities to see the country around. I also learned navigation of the mate, of which I was very fond. When we left Italy, we had delightfully sorry. When we left Italy, we had delightful sailing among the Archipelagos Islands, and from thence to Smyrna in Turkey. This is a very ancient city. The houses are built of stone, and most of them have graves adjoining to them, so that they sometimes present the appearance of churchyards. Provisions are very plentiful in this city, and good wine less than a penny in a pint. The grapes, pomegranates, and many other fruit were also the richest and largest I've ever saw or tasted. The natives are good looking and strong made and always treated me with great civility. In general, I believe they are fond of black people and several of them gave me pressing invitations to stay amongst them although they kept the Franks or Christians separate and do not suffer them to dwell immediately amongst them. I was astonished at not seeing women in any of their shops and very rarely in any in the streets. And whenever I did, they were covered with a veil from head to foot so that I could not see their faces except when any of them out of curiosity uncovered them to look at me, with the, which they sometimes did. I was surprised to see how the Greeks are in some measure kept under by the Turks as, ne as the Negroes are in the West Indies by the white people. The less refined Greeks, as I have already hinted, dance here in the same manner as we do in our nation. On the whole, during our stay here, which was about five months, I liked the place and the Turks extremely well. I could not help observe one remarkable circumstance there. The tails of the sheep are flat and are very large. That I have known the tail of even a lamb to weigh from 11 to 13 pounds. The fat of them is very white and rich and is excellent in puddings. Ill, you're not supposed to eat the fat, mister. Uh, for which it is much used our ship being at lengthy, richly loaded with silk and other articles we sailed for England. In May of 1769, soon after our return from Turkey, our ship made a delightful voyage to Aporto in Portugal, where we arrived at the time of the carnival. On our arrival there, we sent on board of us 36 articles to be observed with very heavy penalties if we should break any of them. And none of us even dared to go on board any other vessel or on shore till the Inquisition had sent on board and searched for everything illegal, especially Bibles. All we had, wow, all we had were produced and certain other things were sent on shore till the ships were going away. And any person in whose custody a Bible was found concealed was to be imprisoned and flogged and sent into slavery for 10 years. Say word. I saw here many magnificent sites, particularly the Garden of Eden, where many of the clergy and laity went in procession in their several orders with the host and sung Te Deum. 
I had a great curiosity to go into some of their churches, but could not gain admittance without using the necessary sprinkling of holy water at my entrance. From curiosity and a wish to be holy, I therefore complied with this ceremony, but his virtues were lost upon me, for I found myself nothing the better for it. This place abounds with plenty of all kinds of provisions. The town is well built and pretty and commands a fine prospect. Our ship having taken in laden of wine and other commodities, we sailed for London and arrived there in July following. So we're going to pick up uh, chapter 9, section 5, most I will in tomorrow. Um, and then we go on to chapter 10 as we're making our way slow and steady through the text. All right. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's not the usual hype. You know, it's something that, you know, we just have to develop our attention spans for and our taste buds for. It's like the bitters. It's like the food that you don't necessarily want to eat, but it's necessary for you to eat to stay healthy. So I, I want to thank those who have had the wherewithal to stay with us through this life project. I will see you most high willing tomorrow. Um, to finish up a lot of Equiano and do a little bit of review. Yeah, we probably have a few more readings. Let me see how many chapters are left. We're on chapter nine, and there are, let me see if they tell me how many chapters are on in the book. Let me go ahead and, I think there are 11, 12, Looks like they're 12 chapters. So we're on chapter nine. We're making our way. All right, everybody have a blessed day.